Well, good morning. Nice to see you all. We pray uh, for you, uh, your elders, and you, the flock at Doxa, often at Five Points, uh, not only in our elder meetings, but in our regular Sunday mornings. Kyle's a wonderful brother. Um, we count you, brothers and sisters in Christ. We're thankful for other gospel-centered churches in the area who are on mission to see the gospel cover uh, our area and to see the knowledge of the Lord um, cover this area as the waters cover the sea. And so, kind of privileged to be with you uh, this morning today and uh, to, to know you as our brothers and sisters in Christ down the road here in Oakland County. Um, I'm going to be speaking from Psalm 25 this morning. Uh, I've loved the Psalms for a long time, but I think the past year or so has made them even more precious to me. Uh, they are prayers that we can take to the Lord all the time. There's encouragement in the Lord all the time. They're driving us to find our joy in the Lord all, their time, all the time. But it's also uh, amazing how honest uh, the psalmists can be at times, sometimes shockingly so. Uh, in fact, um, we're not... You know, I'm not going to sit here and talk about all the psalms this morning, but Psalm 88 uh, is one of uh, the most uh, saddest, also most joyful psalms in all of Scripture. Um, in fact, he thinks at the end, uh, he's telling the Lord, it feels like sometimes darkness is his only friend. Uh, when you find that in Scriptures, uh, it can be somewhat shocking sometimes. And so, uh, a couple, uh, a few months ago, I came across Twitter this saying about um, the lament psalms says, to complain about God is a sin, but to complain to God is a psalm. I like how that pastor who's way more creative than I came up with that note, so here I am telling you that it's not me, but I'm thankful for Twitter to help us find those creative ways of putting <laughs> psalms uh, into categories for us. To complain about God is a sin, but to complain to God is a psalm. And I think that captures well the lament psalms in Scripture. In fact, um, if you haven't spent too much time in the psalms, maybe you don't know, but actually laments make up about a third of the 150 psalms, which means God doesn't just give us permission to complain uh, in times of trouble, but he teaches us how to engage with him in those times and in trials. And psalm 25 is one of those lament psalms. So before we turn to hear from the Lord in Psalm 25, let's pray and ask for his help. Father, we thank you for giving to us your word. Uh, help us with what we do not yet know. Teach us. Uh, give us what we don't yet have. And bring us closer to you in ways that we didn't think possible even in times of trouble. Speak to us, we pray, uh, through your Holy Spirit in the pages of these words. And give us life in Christ. For the, name of, or for the sake of your glory, we pray. Amen. Amen. David wrote this psalm in the midst of troubled times, and it's also then a path for us to walk when we find ourselves in troubled times. And think about being a Christian uh, walking through trials. What, what makes us through? What, how can we walk through those trials? Not with just some vague hope that things will get better in the future, or that our circumstances are bound to change at some point, right? Have you ever heard someone say, things will get better because they can't get any worse? Well, if the last year has taught us anything, things can get worse. And so we don't live on vague hopes. The Bible doesn't expect us to have a stiff upper lip. Nor does God want us to fearfully await for the other shoe to always drop. I find it very helpful that Psalm 25 teaches God's people... God's way of dealing with times of trouble. And I see three things, three ways Psalm 25 teaches us to do just that. So three easy points for us, for us this morning. In times of trouble, go to God, ask of God, and wait on God. Go to God, ask of God, and wait on God. So first, in times of trouble, go to God. If you have your Bibles with me, keep them open in Psalm 25. We're going to we're going to just walk through this and study it together this morning. Look at verse 1. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Now this is King David. So remember, he has lots of stuff at his disposal. He has money. He has power. He has David's mighty men, men of renown, that could kill thousands with a spear and defend plots of land 
just by themselves as the hosts of Philistines come crashing down among them. Not only that, he has wise counselors. He's got the smartest people in the land at his disposal. Yet David doesn't turn to any of those options first. He first turns to God. And he does that by lifting up his soul, he says. So this means he deliberately and prayerfully turns to God and lifts up his soul. He decides to take his life and lift it up, put his life, no matter the outcome he desires, no matter how he thinks God should work it out, he puts everything of him and his own life into God's hands. That means he trusts God to do what God decides is best for him. He takes his hands off the steering wheel, so to speak, and hands life and the control of it over to God. Now that can't be an easy, an easy decision to make. We know that's the right answer, but think about the troubled times David is facing. We see all kinds of trouble David faces in Psalm 25. There's fear. In verses 19 and 20, or in verse 2, there are real enemies, many enemies, too many enemies for David uh, to, to count. They are coming against him. Real enemies. There's shame. You see that he's mocked. Feels like his re reputation is being torn to shreds in verse 2. David faces uncertainty. He doesn't know what to do next as he asks God for guidance in verses 4 and 5. He's very unsure. There's guilt hounding him. He remembers how often he's failed God and all the sins that he's committed against God in verses 6 and 7. And then he is lonely and afflicted. We see David talking about feeling alone throughout the psalm here, but especially in verse 16. So it seems that social distancing and loneliness aren't just a 21st century problem. It hasn't really been a stellar time for David, has it? I mean, when you just think about those things, and most of those are uh, repeated throughout the Psalms, but we get all that in just the first few verses. That's quite a list. And it would be overwhelming if not for the fact that David goes to the God who's bigger than all his troubles. And that's why David's not burned out. That's why he can write a psalm, even a psalm of lament, a hopeful psalm, even as the endless waves of discouragement and trouble crash upon him. Everywhere he turns, he's got another problem. Have you ever felt like that? Look at verse 3, though. This is why he's never burned out or discouraged. Indeed, none who wait for you shall be put to shame. In other words, those who go to God and stay with him will never come to a point where they wish they would have gone to something or someone else for help. So, friends, I find verse 3 so wonderfully life-giving and helpful. I mean, it's honest, isn't it? It's honest about all the trouble that we find in life. The, the troubling times that are so often part and parcel of life in this world. I was just talking to um, uh, Rick in the back about having little kids and I'm getting into an a, a older stage. My kids are in 8th grade, 5th grade, and 2nd grade. And uh, they still uh, act like they're for some time and try to jump on my back. Right? And I'm getting a tad older than I used to be now, so when they attack me from behind, they can take me down quite easily. But they're not trying to attack. They, they think they're four and they want a piggyback ride. Right? But isn't that so often how trouble feels like sometimes? When you weren't expecting it, it just launches and attached itself to your back. And then if you're like David and you just continue to move through life over the years, doesn't it seem like you're just giving trouble a piggyback ride until the very last day you're alive and it finally gets off and attached itself to someone else and you're finally free of the burden. And so it's so life-giving to hear David here. Because he's not whining, even though this is a lament. He's confident. He, he says he's sustained in trouble. Not because he loses this inner strength. He just says he's uncertain, feels guilty, and has dealing with shame. So he's not losing this inner strength or has some vague hope that things are bound to get better at some point. He isn't confident in anything he is or has done. His confidence flows from the God he goes to in his trouble. God's bigger than all these troubles. And indeed, none who wait for him will be put to shame. So in times of trouble... Go to God. Lift up your soul to Him. And that begs the question then, where do you go? Where do you go with your troubles? Well, some of us 
go straight to solutions, right? Some of us go straight to solutions. Problem, here's eight ways to deal with it. And if you don't know that, but you need a solution, there's always the Google machine that will help any one of us out at any time with its solutions. Some of us go straight to friends. This happens and you pick up the phone or send a text. And some go straight into yourself. You're like, this will not defeat me. I can do it. I can, I can, I can. And each of these, David tells us in verse 3, are the first steps to shame. Now please notice I said first steps. These might be next steps. But they can't be the first step. Because all those who go to God will not be put to shame. And all those who don't go to God will be. So they can't be the first step. They might be next step, third step, fourth step, tenth step, but they can't be the first step. So, Docs, I ask, who will you turn to day in and day out in 2021? Will you lift up your souls to God? And remember, I said that is deliberately and prayerfully putting your life into God's hands. So, lift up your souls is a euphemism in the Psalms for prayer. So, maybe we need to ask ourselves, not necessarily where we go, but to diagnose the problem even further, is your life marked by prayer? And if it's not, why, why not? Prayerlessness does not just happen because of poor time management, or busy schedules, or having brand new babies, or having too much to do and not enough time to do it. Prayerlessness doesn't just happen because of any of those excuses. Because when my kids need help, what do they do? They cry out. They cry out for help. So prayerlessness then stems from self-sufficiency. A self-sufficiency that I got this. And only when I don't, where it's too much for me, then I'll go to God. Which means, as we'll see throughout Psalm 25, maybe we're more like David's enemies than we think we are. It's not in God we trust. Uh, it's in us we trust. And yet the same step for uh, us all is the same. Turning from all other hopes and trusts and going to God. Go to God. In times of trouble. Secondly, then, Psalm 25 teaches us to ask of God. Ask of God. Once you go to God, ask of God. And I want to point out two specific things we see David praying for when he goes to God in his trouble. Now, first, we ask for guidance. We need to ask for guidance. Look at verse 4. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. Now, he, remember, all the things David's got going on, all that list of enemies and feelings and trouble, okay? Did you notice what David doesn't pray for first here at the beginning of Psalm 25? He doesn't pray for an escape route. He doesn't pray for relief. He does not pray for ease or comfort. He doesn't, he, excuse me, he does pray for salvation. We'll see that at the end in verse 22. But relief or comfort or elimination of the trial and the trouble, which we so often pray for each other for and ask for, isn't David's first request. Isn't that surprising? Surprising to me. And I wonder why. Why is this not David's first request? And I think it's because it, David knows Escape or relief or comfort are ultimately not what's going to make him happy. He knows his ultimate hope is not where uh, much of the world runs to for salvation. What good, Doxa, is it if you have an easy life, a trouble-free life, if when you come to the end of it, you don't have God? And I think David knows whatever happens in his life, he wants to walk through it with God and at the end of it, have God. So he first asks for guidance. He asks for God's grace to know and live according to God's will. Walking according to God's ways. He, he wants the ability to learn God's paths so he can walk in them. Even in the midst of trouble. No matter where the Lord leads him. Now, we do this all the time, every day. With GPS apps. Right? And even if you know where you're going... You put your destination in because now those apps can tell you if there's an accident or if there's trouble or traffic. So why take the regular route? It's going to take you a half hour longer. 
So we, we put them in, even if you know you're going to grandma's house or to a business meeting you've all been to, and, and you want to avoid all the trouble. Except here in Psalm 25, the destination isn't those things. It isn't not to church on a Sunday morning. It's living life the way God intended. That's what David's asking for God is for. And so when David asks to know God's ways and paths, he, he doesn't mean there's some secret knowledge that has to be discovered or God has to give in order to live. And he isn't also talking about specific decisions, like which school do we send our kids to? How do we do school right now? Do I get these things? Do I do those things? He's not talking about going to college and which one to pick or should I take this job opportunity? He's not talking about specific decisions like that, but when David says ways and paths here in Psalm 25, they're poetic ways. It's a poetic language of referring to the Bible. God's self-disclosure to us, his revealed will. So David is really asking to know how to obey God through understanding the scriptures, the word he's given us. Here is his word. God, help me know it. Make me to know. And he has to pray that, make me to know. Because he realizes that while this information is available to everyone, we don't have the ability in ourselves to put it all together, to understand his word. That's why he prays, make me to know. Now Paul uh, picks this up in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And, and he picks up the same thing that we have to be made to know. He says, the natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God for their folly to him. God's ways are folly to him. And he's not able to understand them because they're spiritually discerned. Now, he doesn't mean that natural people, people who don't have the Holy Spirit, because the Lord hasn't saved them, hasn't rescued them from sin, so they don't have His Spirit helping them. What, what he doesn't mean is that they can't read the Bible. It's in English. They can read it. But he means they can't understand or accept it. Apart from God opening the eyes of the natural person and giving them life, God's ways and His paths, His word is foolishness to us. We'll find other things to put our trust in. We'll find things that are more wise or seem to make more sense. It's foolishness apart from God opening our eyes. And that's why David's enemies are actually taunting him in Psalm 25. They're like, look at this guy. Who, what's he doing? How's he making all these decisions? Look at his trust. Where's his God now? Look at everything around him. Look at all the trials and troubles he's going through. They can't understand why David would go to God. And why he would want to live out his ways. They're mocking him. They're mocking his confidence in God. But that's why David says, make me to know. Don't make me walk away from you. Don't let me walk away from you, Lord. Make me to know your ways. Because people have to be made to know the things of God. That's why David prays in verse 4, make me to know. He's asking for guidance. Humility is a big part of this ask. Humility... Is, is necessary if you're going to ask for how to live, for the guidance necessary to walk in God's ways and paths. I like to not have to put in the address into the GPS, you know, app. I want to not have to depend on that, right? Then I definitely don't want to when I'm lost, because then I have to admit with everyone else in the car seeing it, I have totally, absolutely no idea where I am or how to get out of this mess. How many of you uh, have puppy? Recently, or I've ever had a puppy and had a house train one. Anyone got one like right now? Yeah, she's got one right now at home, so she knows, right? You got a puppy, they make messes, they bite things, they don't know how to live in your house. They use the bathroom wherever they want and what, where, wherever they want. They have to be made to know. And though none of us like to be referred to as unhouse trained puppies, that's what David is teaching us in Psalm 25. He's teaching us that we need the kind of humility that understands we have no ability in ourselves to walk God's ways and paths unless He helps us, unless He makes us to know. In other words, only those who know that they don't know God's ways will humble themselves to be taught God's ways. We need a humility that will constantly come to God and say, I need you. Help me. Teach me. Don't leave me off. Help me to know your ways. That's why David prays in verse 9, God leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his ways. Again, verse 4, make me to know. Make me to know your ways. 
So that's the first thing David teaches us to ask for God, for guidance. And then the second thing is to ask for forgiveness. Look at verses 6 and 7. Remember your mercy, O Lord, and your steadfast love, for they have been from of old. Remember not the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me for the sake of your goodness, O Lord. Then drop down to verse 11. For your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my guilt, for it is great. And again, drop down to verse 18. Consider my affliction and my trouble, and forgive all my sins. So what we see over and over in Psalm 25 is that among all the trials and trouble that David faces, he doesn't believe any of them are more dangerous than his own sin. What's the greatest trouble and danger, the greatest enemy David faces? It's his own sin. That's why he keeps asking God to pardon him, to remember not those sins, to forgive him of all his sins. And that's why it first leads David to ask for guidance. So that he doesn't sin. He wants to know how not to sin against God. How to walk through life with God, even in the midst of trouble. And then he asks for God for forgiveness. To forgive him of all the ways that he has sinned. And so this means asking for forgiveness in Psalm 25 is, is often different than the typical way we think about it. He's not just asking for forgiveness for the bad things he's done. For some bad things uh, that he uh, uh, did throughout the day. It's actually much broader than that when we think of it in terms of ways and paths. He's pointing to an entire way of living that's against God. Uh, a, a way of life that's a, living in apart from God. And in our time, many of us see and have people all around us, and this, the, the, the world around us tempts us to find our life, our identity, our happiness, our worth, or anything other than in God. We find our life, our salvation apart from God. So it's not just doing a couple things bad, but the rest of my day, I did all right. It's more of an entire way of living that's against God. Now, Tim Keller, uh, he hopefully talks about sin in this way. He says it like this. Sin isn't only doing bad things. It's more fundamentally making good things into ultimate things. Making good things into God is what he's saying. Sin is building your life and meaning on anything, even a very good thing, other than God. And that's why David prays, make me to know your ways. Because this is inherent in sinners. We're bent on building our lives on anything but God. Because all we know is sin. That's what we know. That's what's natural to us. So we have to pray, God, make me to know your way. Guide me. Forgive me of all the ways that I've lived on everything else but you. And so we see how that guidance and forgiveness then go together here when we ask of God. We ask for God in His grace to forgive us. And if you're like me and want to be honest for a moment, sometimes we have to ask God to even restrain us. Keep me on the path. Don't let me go. We're prone to wander. Lord, I feel it. We just sang it this morning. It's so easily to come off our lips, but then we walk out and we wonder, oh man, you know, we can just walk according to our own ways. And it's not until we're in the, the thick of it that we realize we've wandered. So we pray, God, even restrain me today. Keep me from temptation, Lord. Make me to know your way and guide me. So before we move on, think of it this way. Martin Luther, he famously wrote, began the 95 Theses that he nailed to the door so long ago. The very first one said this, the Christian life is one of repentance. The Christian life is one of repentance. And I think that's what we see here. You don't just repent, that's the first step in the kingdom, and then you never repent again. For Martin Luther, repentance is this daily turning from seeking our life and joy and salvation and health and hope and anything but God, and daily seeking God, turning away from those things and turning to God. And Psalm 25 teaches us to ask for the grace to do just that, to live a life of seeking and repenting, turning. So in times of trouble, go to God. Next, ask of God. Ask of God for guidance and forgiveness. And then thirdly, in times of trouble, wait. Wait on God. Look at verse 3. Indeed, none who wait for you shall be put to shame. Then verse 5. For you I wait all the day long. And verse 21. For you I wait. For I wait for you. And those are just the explicit mentions of waiting, but it's implied throughout the psalm, isn't it? 
He's praying. That's what he's doing. He's going to God. And he's waiting for God. While all the enemies surround him, while the trouble roils around him, David waits. He mentions it over and over. And he keeps asking for the grace to wait. Why? Well, unless you're a fantastic human being, and utterly different than probably 99% of us in the world, waiting is not easy. Patience is hard. Especially, especially hard to wait on God, isn't it? When you can say along with David in verse 15, there seems to be a net around my feet. And instead of stepping out of it, what does David do first? He goes to God. You would, you would think, I've got to get out of the net. But what's he first do? Go to God. Now, I'm not necessarily saying these are one and then step four. I'm just saying maybe step one is God help me and then you get out of the net. <laughs> you know? Um, so, but it, it, it's a humility that never wants to move apart from God and without His grace. Because then, when you do get out of the net, you realize you have no opportunity to boast in yourself. Say, I got myself out of that. But if you pray first and then you get out of the net, all glory is to God. Because He helped you. You went to Him. It was His salvation. He worked through you and in you to glorify Himself. And you're out of the net. But sometimes it's hard, isn't it? It's hard. When you can't do something as easy as just taking a step out of the trouble. When you're in the midst of it, it seems to be closing around you. And you're, God, do you know? Do you hear? God, I'm in trouble. It's like a net is enclosing around me. God. That's what we see David here, 22 verses over and over, prayerfully waiting. And look at verse 17. These are some of the reasons why I love the Psalms, because they give such deep, rich language to our experience. The troubles of heart are enlarged, meaning trouble seems to be swallowing me up. Or the sorrows that are here and that I'm feeling, they make it feel like I'm about to burst. That I've had it up to here with all this trial and trouble. And if I get one more thing, <laughs> I don't know how I'm going to be able to handle it. it, it the, the language is like a great meal. When you're with some friends, you're having a great time, you don't want the time to end, but you don't want the food to stop. And the music is just going, and you just love it, right? You just don't want anything to happen. You don't want the night to end. And you, 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 have you ever had like your stomach feel like it's right here? And you're like, I don't need to eat for like two days. And then like what, someone else says, hey, pass that plate. It looks so good. But now all of a sudden it's like there's not, there's not one more millimeter for any morsel of food. Okay? So that's the good way of thinking about this. David takes that feeling that we all know that we don't want it to end. We're just so full on that side. He says that's what sorrows can make you feel like another time. And Lord, if there is one more drop of trouble, I feel like my heart is going to burst. I can't take it. And so to our ears, when you're in that moment, or you have a friend that is in that moment, and you long to do something, and we hear, wait, can we be honest just for a moment? And say, that sounds stupid. <laughs> Maybe Kyle will never have me back. But I'm a pastor that says, waiting sounds stupid. It sounds dumb. I know it's the Sunday school answer. Read your Bible and pray every day. Saying that like over and over every Sunday when I was a kid growing up. But it sounds dumb. It sounds ridiculous. But that's because we don't think of waiting the same way Psalm 25 does. That's waiting from the natural perspective. But waiting in the Psalms aren't like waiting for the light to turn green and you're in a hurry to get somewhere and none of the cars are moving because someone's on their phone. You're like honking the horn. You're like, let's go! Or you're waiting for your friend or a spouse or some kid to show up so that you can get on with your day and do the things you've been planning. It's not this nervous energy pacing about. It's what we see here in Psalm 25. It's this active trust in God. Waiting is not passive. It's active trust in the Psalms. And often in trouble... Waiting, then, is a minute-by-minute minute activity. I have to learn to trust. It's what verse 15 says. My eyes are ever toward the Lord. My eyes are ever towards the Lord. And when you're in the moments when trouble is weighing down on you, your eyes are tempted to dart everywhere else. But he says, no, my eyes are ever towards the Lord. He's my hope and my salvation. My eyes are ever toward Him. Right? Not my problems. 
not my worries, not my fears, not my anxieties, not where the solutions are going to come from first, but on God. So that means when other things tempt us to stop waiting on God, even in the hardest times of trouble, we refocus our hope in God. We wait on Him. And again, waiting is active, so how can we do this? Well, we remember who God is and how He's helped His people in the past out of times of trouble. We recall what He's already done for us on the cross and in Christ. And if He gave us His own Son, will He not also graciously give us all things? And we recall these promises to mind in these moments. That's how you wait in the Bible. It's active trust. It's not sitting around doing nothing or pacing nervously about waiting for something to happen. It's ever turning our eyes and hearts towards the Lord. I'm not going to go anywhere else. I'm not going to look for solutions first or go anywhere else because those are the first steps to shame even when the net is closing around me. I'm going to turn my eyes and hearts towards the Lord. And that's why we need brothers and sisters who know Psalm 25. Because I can't do this when the trouble is surrounding me on my own. I'm not strong enough. And neither are any of us, if we're honest. I need the church to come around me and say, Brother and sister, let's pray. We can do this. We can walk. Let's do it together. Let's turn our hearts towards together. Let's remember who God is, what He's done, what He's promised. Let's turn our eyes towards the Lord. And I find this so helpful because David shows us what he does. That's what he does did in times of trouble when he was tempted to stop waiting in faith. He went to God. He opened his heart in prayer and asked of God. And then he sought the grace he desperately needed to wait in faith upon God. So that he can then declare, even in the midst of great trouble, that those who trust in God will never be put to shame. Even when his enemies, and maybe even at times his friends, laugh at his waiting on the Lord. Because his hope was in the Lord, and he knew that if his hope was in the Lord, he'd never be put to shame. David waited. In times of trouble, wait on God. Now look at the last verse here. David wraps this all up for us in this last verse of Psalm 25. Verse 20, or, yeah, Psalm 25, verse 22. Redeem Israel, O God, out of all his troubles. Now in many ways, this is the key verse of Psalm 25. Everything has been building towards this, but it's kind of in a weird way. You can't see it in English, but in the Hebrew, this psalm is an acrostic psalm. Okay, so what it means is each line of the psalm starts with a successive letter of the Hebrew alphabet. So in some ways, this is like God's ABCs of getting through times of trouble. Okay, now there are a few exceptions. Okay, it skips a couple letters sometimes throughout the psalm, but it's always another letter. All right, so if it's like A, B, C, it might skip E, but then it goes right to F. So it's still successive. There's a few exceptions, but you, there's this pattern all the way through until you get to Psalm, or excuse me, verse 22, and the pattern breaks. It's like seeing A, B, C, D, E, F, A, and everyone around you is like, Man, that kid, he needs to go back to kindergarten because that's not how it goes, right? T, U, V, W, X, Y, A, okay? Now, it's kind of funny, right? So if you're reading this psalm, and you're getting the ABCs, all of a sudden you're like, whoa, you're kind of jarred out of the rhythm, right? And isn't that often like trouble? You're just going about your day, and all of a sudden a speed bump of a trial hits you. You're jarred out of like, your sense of peace and calm and comfort, that sense that of, I can do life, I got this. You know, and then all of a sudden something happens and it drives you back to the Lord. That's what Psalm 25 is kind of like. And you can't see the acrostic in English, but actually most transla uh, translations highlight this. Probably in your Bible, it does in the ESV. You have everything just right there, and then all of a sudden there's a larger space before, before verse 22. It's kind of waking you up to say, listen, this is God's uh, last word, the last cry of this lament. He saved the best for last. Redeem Israel, O God, out of all his troubles. Now let's look at this. So Israel is biblical shorthand for the people of God. And in the New Testament, we're told that Israel is now not just ethnic, but it's anyone who has faith uh, in Jesus Christ alone for salvation. Okay? So if you come to Jesus, you're, you're Israel, biblical shorthand uh, for the people of God in the Bible. And redeem also has a rich biblical history, doesn't it? Redeem means purchase. Now, when we first see this in the Bible, uh, in a major way, it's the redemption price for freeing Israel from their slavery in Egypt. And what was the redemption price? 
It was either a lamb with its blood on the doorpost, or what? The firstborn son. If they didn't have it, that was the purchase price for freeing Egypt, or Israel from Egypt and their slavery. Which means redeem them biblically points also forward to the time when God would send the Lamb of God, His only Son, Jesus, to pay with His own blood the purchase price to redeem His people from their sins and the just eternal death that sin demands. But not only that, redeem points even further. And we see that in verse 22, to a time when God will make everything right again in this broken world, where there will be no more troubles, verse 22, out of all his troubles. And we like to spiritualize this in the church, that, that this is just spiritual trouble. But all means all, not just spiritual trouble. Of course, trial and trouble are in the world because of sin. And sin is a curse, and it's cursed this world, and God has come to redeem it. But when he does redeem us, not just out of our spiritual mess, he will redeem us out of all of it, all our troubles. And so when we're in the midst of troubles, one way Psalm 25 equips us to be awaiting people is to remind us that there's coming a day when God will redeem us out of all our troubles. Never again will you have a friend call you and say, I have cancer. Never again will you have a friend say, I, I can't breathe. I have such anxiety and a panic attack right now. There, there's one day coming where there'll be no more envy or strife or awkward tensions, or job losses, or hatred, or bullying. There will be a day where there's even no more tears, when sadness has been banished forever. And so we can say, just like David, yes, 2020 was a pretty troubling year. And maybe for you, 2020 has been, 2021 has been more of the same. But what is our hope? But trouble will not have the final word. For God's people, and in Psalm 25, what is the final word? Why is it that we can wait on God? The final word is not trouble, but redeemed. God's people will be redeemed from all their trouble. That's our final word. For those who hope and trust in Christ alone, redeemed is our hope. And that's what is the, that's the banner that flies over our lives, even in the midst of trouble. And that's how this psalm saves the best for last and equips us to wait. Because even in the most troubling times, we can wait. Not because we have some vague hope, or we're just kind of stoic with a stiff upper leg saying, yeah, it's going to get better at some point. But we have a certain sure hope that God promises to redeem His people from all their troubles. Whether I see that in my lifetime or not. So in other words, we can wait because God's past faithfulness fuels our present waiting. That's why waiting isn't passive. It's active trust. It's recalling to mind God's past faithfulness so that I can be presently waiting for the fulfillment of all His promises. Waiting isn't passive. It's that verse 15. My eyes are ever towards the Lord because He's never failed in the past and He surely isn't going to stop now. But again, I know that's easy to say on a Sunday in a room like this. But what about this afternoon or this week when it turns out God's timetable isn't your timetable? Or that God's timing isn't your timing? And then all of a sudden we have Psalm 25. And that's the hardest part, isn't it? To wait in moments like that. But it's even in those moments that we must throw ourselves back on God's faithfulness to fuel our present waiting. So verse 22 then teaches us how to wait. Not just because of God's past faithfulness, but then His future promise of redemption. So think about it. Where do you turn to in times of trouble? Usually it's, we want to get back to normal. Or I want to have this or have that, or I just want this to end and get back to my life. But verse 22 teaches us that our ultimate hope isn't in having an easy, trouble-filled life. That our ultimate hope is in God one day redeeming us from all those troubles. So that troubles never come again. And that he will bring me to that moment when he will eradicate trial and trouble and sin and death once and for all. And so in times of trouble then, just wait for God to get you out of this one. But cast your hopes upon that one day where he will once and for all redeem his people from all.
all their trouble. And I don't know about you as we close this morning. Maybe you don't have this kind of trouble surrounding you right at the moment. Maybe you do. But either way, we either help one another through trials or troubles, or we'll need to be helped through them at some point. There's always uh, trial and trouble around, right? Well, I think, I don't know who said it first, but you might hear it often. You're either about to go into a trial, you're in a trial, or you're just coming out of one, but then you start over again, right? There's one around the corner. So how are you going to face that? With, oh, you know, be stoic and await the other shoe to drop? No, we wait on God in these three ways that we've seen this morning. And what I find very helpful is that to be God's people means we're awaiting people. It's what it means to be God's people, that we're people who wait, not just in trials and trouble, but always, because Psalm 25 closes the same way the Bible does, with waiting. Revelation 22, 21 and 21 says, surely I am coming soon. And what is the response? Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. And until then, we wait with our eyes ever towards the Lord. So, Father, we ask that you would teach us your ways, so that we might walk in your paths and be your waiting people, longing for the day when our Lord Jesus Christ comes one day soon to redeem us out of all our troubles. And until that day, help us to wait for the sake of your name among our neighbors and the nations we ask.